Good morning, church. Good morning. God is good. And all the time. Amen. You guys sound a little sleepy, though. Is it the weather changes? Like, I understand. I, I've learned very well that when you live in southwest Missouri, you can have first fall, second summer, maybe even a th first winter, and then second fall comes. And so um, it's all right. And it's all right to kind of be tired at times. Um, there's times of rest and there's times of energy and action. And so that's all right. Those of you that are visiting with us, welcome. As Brad said up here earlier, we are a church family that simply wants to be like Jesus and follow him and have our focus on him. And it's such a blessing to be able to lead, to be able to teach from that perspective because it means that he is our rock. He is our firm foundation. I don't have to be that I get the trust in him. And so as we follow Jesus together, we want to welcome you here if you're visiting. And if you're live streaming along with us, we welcome you as well. It's really good to be together and be able to worship the Lord our God together. And it is good, good news to know him. We are in the midst of a series where we're looking at the truth that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's no way to the Father except through me. And in the midst of that series, we come to a realization that not only is Jesus our Savior who shows us the way to the Father, but in showing us the way to the Father, he teaches us. He's our teacher. He's our rabbi, as his followers 2,000 years ago called him. And they followed him and trusted him. And in the midst of that, we recognized and we looked at the history of it, that when a rabbi said, come, follow me, and said, you can be my student, that means that rabbi believes in his student. To first of all, learn how to be like him, to recognize the truth that there's learning that needs to be done. There's growth and fixing or whatever, however you want to call it, as a teacher that needs to be done. But the outcome of that is that that student is able to be like the rabbi. And if we look at Jesus and recognize the truth that he is perfect and without sin, we recognize the truth that means Jesus believes that we can be the same as well. I find that really interesting. Because in the Sermon on the Mount, in the midst of the series that we've been talking about, that we've been studying, that we've been looking at together, and hopefully that you've been reading throughout the weeks as we've been going over this, I've noticed that Jesus really calls us out towards perfection. He really gives us some lessons. I don't know about you, but for me, they really hit at my heart. They hit at my, the essence of who I am as a human being that I really struggle with. I would say that they even hit at my soul because there are things in my life that Jesus calls me out on, and he, he says, I've got lessons for you on that. I've got teaching for you. And it's weird when I realize that Jesus is saying, if I am teaching you, that means I believe in you to learn. And he says the same thing to you. He says the same thing to you that you are able to be like him. You're able to get through these lessons no matter how hard they are and learn from them and grow and to be made better. Let me look at it another way. When we sing the song, the wise man built his house upon the rock and the foolish man built his house upon the sand and the rains come tumbling down and the floods come up, we often look at the storm of all that and we look at the house and what that all means and we forget about the truth that everybody that owns a house realizes that there's, when you move into that house and you're like, oh, this is my perfect house, after hopefully a couple of years, but oftentimes after a couple of months, you look at your house and go, Oh, my perfect house needs work. <laughs> There's leaks that need to be repaired in the plumbing sometimes. Um, maybe when cold weather comes in, like what we're going to get the next couple of days, and you forget to close off uh, um, your outside faucets and cover them up and disconnect the hoses, you're going to find a, a valve that's broken in a couple of days if you forget about that. By the way, that's my warning for you homeowners, to disconnect your hoses today, because you're going to need to. But if you forget about that kind of stuff, there's repairs that need to be made. When storms come, sometimes siding gets broken or windows get damaged or gutters need to be fixed. Um, even when the leaves fall or in the spring when all those weird squiggles off the oak trees fall, you've got to get up there and you've got to be able to fix those things because it's part of owning a house. You've got to keep it clean. Some of us do better than others, and when you have two young kids in the house, it's really, really hard, but you've got to take care of it. You've got to clean it, because otherwise, other things will come move into the house and start infesting it and having issues, and it's got to be your perfect house that you remembered. 
you set it up and shape it and stock it and maintain it so that way you can have guests over. The house isn't just about yourself or even just about your family, but it's about you in community with your neighbors. And if we're honest, sometimes with our not so neighbors. I think Jesus calls them enemies in the Sermon on the Mount. And what we find out as homeowners, and by the way, if you rent or lease or whatever, you, you run into the same exact stuff. It's not the exact same, but it is wisdom about living and um, being that you've got to maintain. You've got to take care of things. Sometimes furniture needs to be replaced. Sometimes flooring needs to be taken care of or replaced. And what we find out here is that when Jesus gives us this allegory, this parable, that he ends his sermon on the mount about, that we need to recognize the truth is he's not saying you have to be perfect on your own. When he says earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, it's almost right in the middle, that be perfect, therefore, as my Father in heaven is perfect. He's announcing a truth that we have some maintenance to do as we learn from him and follow him. So open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 7. We're at the end of the chapter. We're in verse number 24 through 27. I want to show you something and let Jesus do all the teaching. What we're going to do is we've already read Matthew 5 and Matthew 6 together in the sermon series that we've been going through. We're going to read Matthew 7 together, and we're going to actually go through backwards, chunk by chunk, looking at what Jesus does here with his teachings. Because, as we found out in our morning Bible class this morning, that as kids, when we hear that the wise man builds his house upon the rock and the foolish man builds his house upon the sand— We don't really make this practical an application about our lives. Instead, we think about the houses and the rocks and the sands and the storms and forget that Jesus is really talking about us and what we can do practically to be the people that we were meant to be, to be these strong houses that have a firm foundation. And so let's read this and maybe, and then go back and maybe we can learn something from the Sermon on the Mount that when Jesus says, be perfect, therefore, as my Father in heaven is perfect, we can recognize the truth that though we do have some repairs some t- at times for our house, that what Jesus says is that if you're built on a firm foundation, on the right foundation, that it'll be all right. It'll be good. And even when the storms come, and there might even be some storm damage from the storms, that the house is still livable and it is still good. And I'm going to argue from the rest of Scripture that God can dwell in it. Matthew 7, verse 24. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell down and the floods came up and the winds blew and beat against the house but it did not fall. Notice he doesn't say it did not get damaged. It did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell down and the floods came up and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell and great was that fall. I love how the kids, when the foolish man's house went smashed, they're, they're all about that part. So much so, I think one of the adults said that they had to watch out for their friend that was next to them because they were worried that they were going to get hit by part of that smash that was going on. Jesus has wisdom for us. He has teachings for us that he believes can impact our lives and bless us and be there. And he believes that so much, he uses a parable to say, hey, I've got teachings for you. And here's what happens if you pay attention to them and make them a part of your life. So I want to encourage you, church, as we go through chapter 7, going in reverse order, I want to encourage you, remember that the whole purpose of this, of the Sermon on the Mount, as Jesus concludes it, is that we hear his words and obey them and learn them. Look what he says here in verse number 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, on on that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. It's interesting. Didn't Jesus come to give us grace? And didn't these people say that they're doing things in his names? 
Jesus is saying what we've already been looking at in the Sermon on the Mount here, that the kingdom of heaven is a lot more than just your outward actions. It's a change of the heart. It's a recognizing of the truth that you can live in the kingdom of heaven now and that you want to live with joy and with hope, with letting God reshape you and mold you, or in the house metaphor, do maintenance on you. That you can be what you're, you're supposed to be as that perfect house. He says, there, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now you go back in the Sermon on the Mount and you recognize that he's already talked about this. When he said, this then is how you should pray. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Not just sometime in the future when Jesus comes again, but on earth as it is in heaven. Now! And so he's already witnessed to us about this teaching, about this understanding, about this honesty. That he believes that we can obey his word, that we can do something about it. Now jump down to verse number 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Okay? Got to say that one more time, because didn't we just read about not everyone who comes and says, Lord, Lord, will inherit the kingdom of heaven, but those who obey his word? Well, it's kind of weird going backwards. We start seeing a, a continuousness in his teaching, which sometimes we miss when we go the opposite way. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And they'll say, but we did things in your name. And he'll say, depart from me. I didn't recognize your fruit. I never knew you. Jump back again to verse number 12. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Enter the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life. Those who find it are few. I hope you notice the continuing metaphors that are going on here. There's metaphors of destruction. There's metaphors of life and being good and being useful, being what you're supposed to be. The wise man's house is built upon a rock. The foolish man's house is built upon the sand and goes smash. He's got something for us to hear and something for us to learn. By the way, we're ever getting closer to verse number one and two here. And maybe the worldly understanding that people have about Jesus' teaching here in verse number one is wrong. Because how are you going to know good fruit from bad fruit unless you look at it and judge it? How are you going to know a wolf in sheep's clothing? You've got to make a determination. You've got to listen to the words of the teacher and do what he says in order to make sense. And one of the things that he thinks makes a whole lot of sense for us is in everything we do, we do to others what we would have them do to us. Which is a good way of saying, treat others like you want to be treated. Verse 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks find, and the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, are you noticing how this is carrying over with the tree and good fruit and that kind of stuff? How much more will the Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? In the midst of this all, Jesus says that if we search the will of the Father and do the will of the Father, the things that we ask, seek, and knock for will be good, will be right. 
If we really go to the Father, we'll get the things that we need, the things that sustain us and give us life and give us rightness instead of the things that could harm us. He says, what kind of father would he be if the son came to him and asked him for some bread, would give him a stone instead? By the way, remember what happened in the uh, wilderness when Jesus was really hungry? What Satan said, hey, look at this stone. Just tell it to become a loaf of bread. Did you guys catch that, how that's connecting here? Or which one of your, which father would say when his son says, hey, I'm hungry, give me a fish, would give him a snake instead? By the way, I do recognize that Bear Grylls and others would be like, oh yeah, this can be food and do a whole bunch of weird things, but that was unclean for the Jewish people. It'd be like saying, by the way, I'm, I'm very thankful for that things have changed and that we can eat different things because I like catfish. It'd be the same thing as saying which good father would say when his son's hungry would give him a catfish instead of a bass instead because they couldn't eat catfish. It didn't have scales and therefore it was unclean for him. A serpent could bite, bite and have venom. There were a lot of venomous serpents in that area during that time. What Jesus is telling us is that if we built our houses on the right foundation, there's not going to be damage. It's not going to be complete, outright, utter disarray and uncontrol. It'll be all right. It'll be good, even in the storms of life. And then we get to verse 1 through 2. Keep in mind, this whole section ends with the parable of a house that is built and that eventually needs to be maintained. It needs to be taken care of for it to be that perfect house. Judge not unless you be judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. I know a lot of people have liked to look at this verse and read it as that we shouldn't judge at all, but that is unbiblical. It is against what Jesus teaches us. Otherwise, we are going to be in the midst of ravenous wolves in sheep clothing and not recognize them by their fruits. We're going to eat fruit from diseased trees that's going to be bad for us instead of eating fruit from good trees. We're going to be picking figs from the midst of the thorns, or as any good Missourian knows, we will be getting hit with all of the thorns of those blackberry bushes that we get our hands in when, if you're smart about it, you can put your hand and get the good fruit and that's underneath and not have the thorns worry you. Jesus is teaching us about wisdom, a better way of life, which means that you have a right foundation in that. So let's continue on. Maybe his next metaphor has means for us understanding what that means of how to judge right instead of judging wrong. Why do you see the speck of sawdust that's in your brother's eye? By the way, when you build a house, everybody that's done carpentry in here, why do you wear glass safety glasses? A sawdust messes you up. Why do you see the speck of sawdust that's in your brother's eyes, but you do not notice the log that is sticking out of your own eye? These are building terms. I hope you've heard this. I hope that you notice this. He's saying if you're going to notice a problem in somebody else and make a judgment on them, and you are even worse off in the midst of that pr problem, think of it this way. Those of you that have used a table saw, you know this. Table saws are one of the most dangerous elements in carpentry. The reason is it's a saw blade that turns back towards you. You feed the wood in onto it on top of the saw on this table, and the saw blade goes through the wood, and it feeds back towards you. If you do not have hold and control of both of those pieces of wood as it's going through, what's the potentiality to happen? It's going to launch back at you. When that piece comes loose, if you're only pushing the side that's on the inside of, against the fence and you're letting that other piece go on there and you're not touching it at all, it has a potential of kicking back at you and flying back at you. Same thing if you only hold the outside piece and you're not holding the other, which, by the way, is even worse. You have to secure both pieces as they go through. You have to have that. Now, the piece on the left, I know, for those of you that use table saws, is a whole lot safer. You really need to hold the one on the right. But, man, I've had a piece on the left move on me a couple of times and scare me. If you're cutting wood, and there's somebody else over there cutting wood, and your piece just launched and hit you in the eye and is digging in your brain, and you look over at them, and they, they, they've just got, like, little specks of sawdust. You're like, why aren't you wearing your glasses? 
are you really in a place to judge? <laughs> what Jesus is telling us and teaching us here is he's not saying don't judge at all. What he's saying is, hey, if you are going to judge, judge in the way that you want to be judged to. Judge with love, with kindness, with grace, with mercy. Judge with the teachings that he gives us. So when he says things like, you've heard that it was said that you shall not murder, I say that when you get angry at your brother, it's like murdering them. Or you've heard that it was said don't commit adultery, but I tell you that if a woman even looks, or that if a man even looks at a woman with lust in his heart, you can say the same thing in reverse. I think Jesus is okay with it. That if a woman even looks at a man with lust in her heart, she's committed adultery. Jesus is teaching us a new and better way, recognizing the truth that we need to learn from the teacher first before we can even begin to be a part of the teaching. We've got to have a better understanding. So if you've got a log, of a two-by-four sticking out of your eye while you're doing some construction work and the guy next to you just has a bit of speck of sawdust, well, let's see what he says about it. Or how can, he, how can you say to your brothers, verse 4, let me take that speck out of your eye. When there is a log in your own eye, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Did you catch that? He doesn't say, don't ever take the speck out of their eye. He says, do something that's wise before you do that, so that way you're treating them like you would want to be treated. Because I don't know about you, but if I've got a speck of sawdust in my eye and somebody's like, I don't know, just accidentally cut their fingers off on a, on a saw. I don't want them coming and helping me at that moment. They're not in a good, safe position to come and help me, right? We've got to live better and live wiser and have our foundation be firm first. Do not give to dogs what is holy and do not throw your pearls before pigs lest they trample them underfoot and turn and attack you. We go back to the parable, to the allegory that he says at the end of all this when he says the wise man builds his house upon the rock. Anybody that listens to these words of mine and obeys them is like a wise man who builds his house upon the rock. And when the storms come, the house stands. Doesn't mean that there's not going to be damage. And one of the other ways that we need to look at it is if we've got our houses built on the rock, it doesn't mean that storms aren't going to come. What it means is that we have the wisdom and the learning from the lessons as we follow Jesus to be established and rooted on the foundation that is good. And I'm going to argue that he means himself. That he means him and his wisdom. Because you go through the rest of the New Testament, you get, especially the book of Matthew, and you have messages, passages, where Peter declares in chapter 16 that you are the Messiah to Jesus, and he says, based on this confession... You are Peter. You are the rock. I'm going to build my church. And so Jesus teaches us a new and better way. And when we read through the Sermon on the Mount, we recognize the truth that we have a lot to learn, a lot of maintenance for God to do on us and to shape us. And we recognize the truth that it's in Jesus that we have the ability to be able to even listen to these lessons and to be a part of it. And as the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 10, it's one of my favorite verses, be perfect Oh, wait, that's Matthew. That's where the Sermon on the Mount he says he's forever perfecting those who are already made perfect. As we follow Jesus and as we let him be our foundation, our solid rock, God sees us as the perfect house. Sure, there's some maintenance to be done every now and then, but it is still the perfect house. I've noticed that um, when people are ready to move, and go into another house that they find perfect for their family, like maybe as families grow, as there's more kids, and as a house needs to expand and that kind of stuff. I, I've noticed that um, until it's right about time for a sale, some maintenance things kind of go by the wayside, right? What Jesus is teaching us is that God is forever thinking that because of him, that those who listen to the words of Jesus and do them are a good place to be. He sees us as his house. And I believe firmly that he keeps the maintenance up. We've just got to trust in him and obey his word. We've got to listen to this message and realize that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, that it is now and it is a place for us. Which is why we go to the middle of all of this where he says, 
Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Let Jesus be your firm foundation. Trust him. Listen to him. Know that he believes in you to be like him. He believes in you to learn from his lessons. He has faith in you. Have faith in him and trust him and turn towards him. And you're going to get good things. It doesn't mean that storms aren't going to come. What it does mean is when those storms come, you'll stand no problem. There may be a little bit of damage, but it's not outright damage. Well, another way of saying it is Jesus came to give life and to give it to us abundantly. The opposite of that would be death. He came that we may not die. Spiritually and physically, because we have hope that when, we, when our bodies do die, if, they, if Jesus doesn't come yet, that we're going to be risen again. He came that we may have life and have it abundantly. So I encourage you, read the Sermon on the Mount every now and then. I know it's tough. I know there's places that are challenging that are a struggle, but it is good news because he believes in us that we can build our house on a firm foundation on him who gave his life and rose again that we may have life. So trust in him. If you need prayer for anything or you're ready to follow Jesus because you believe in him, I ask you to come forward when we stand and sing in just a moment. And I pray the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord turn his face to you and give you peace. And by the way, that shalom word there for peace means health. And in a sense, it means warmth as well. For the next two days, I pray that you have the warmth of the Father with you as it's getting cold out there. Let us stand and sing.